Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind überall, von Lithuania bis zum Sahel, von Afghanistan bis Irak bis Libanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olaker. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope. Here in the studio today, we are talking with Heather Gravy. Heather is the director of the Open Society European Policy Institute and the director of EU Affairs there. She has been thinking and writing about populism and the future of Europe. So welcome, Heather. I'm going to start off by asking you, populism, like fascism, is a term with as many definitions as it has people defining it, it sometimes seems. What is your working definition of populism? I would use a very narrow, parsimonious definition from the political science literature, particularly the work of the Dutch political scientist Cas Mudder, who puts it forward as a thin-centred ideology. Populism is essentially a worldview which claims that there's a fundamental division between the corrupt elite and the pure people. And the populist leader claims to represent the pure people against the corrupt elite and argues that it's not possible for the elite to serve the people and that only he, and it's usually a he, there are a few she's, is the one who represents their interests by knowing them and by uh, understanding the, the general will of the people. So you'll hear often terminology used by populists like the will of the people. Is this something that is a right-wing phenomenon, a left-wing phenomenon? It's ideologically extremely flexible. It's a thin-centred ideology which can attach itself to any form of grievance, injustice and fear. So you find it in left-wing forms around, for example, countering globalization, claiming that the people are, are being done down by some kind of international conspiracy of capitalism. But you also find a more rightish flavoured uh, version of populism, which is much more anti-migration. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not really right or left. It can adopt tropes and symbols and arguments from any part of the political spectrum. And in fact, I think populism is very much something that flourishes when right and left are breaking down as political categories. When voters are looking for something new, uh, when they feel that their grievances are, are not being addressed by either right or left. Um, and populism tends to thrive when there's a massive weakness of mainstream parties. And does it seem to be to you on the rise or is it actually always been part of the system? And has it always been part of politics since human beings uh, began organising themselves? Populism is a, a normal part of democratic debate. Uh, Margaret Canavan, the British political scientist, calls it the dark side of democracy. It's always there lurking in the shadows. Um, but there's a huge difference now in Europe from, say, 10 years ago, when populists on the whole were getting between 5 and maybe 15% of the vote in various countries. And now, when they're getting 25 or even 35% of the vote, that's a huge difference. It moves from being a marginal part of uh, the political debate to being much more mainstream. And that starts to affect all the other parties and indeed the whole political discourse. It affects what politics is about. Because for populists, politics is not about policy choices. It's not about do you want a more redistributive a uh, system in the economy? Do you want to have various kind of policy choices? Instead, it's about identity. It's about hostile tribes. And populists always seek wedge issues that drive people apart, that drive them into these different hostile tribes. And so having this level of support for populism really fundamentally changes political debates. Is some of this related to the rise of digital media, to the ways in which we communicate and interact with one another through technology. Populism is thriving because of the breakdown of the post-war party order, that the mainstream, the big tent mainstream parties of centre-left and centre-right are losing voters and losing a sense of what uh, distinguishes them from one another. They've all moved to the centre on economic policy, for example, and they've all lost control because governments can no longer uh, control, for example, economic forces the way that they did before globalisation and certainly during the Cold War. So populism is thriving because of a sense among voters that governments no longer uh, can deliver justice and can deliver control of economic circumstances and, and indeed of security the way that they used to. And I think that digital media play into this because they also increase the sense of loss of control. They give people the sense that they don't really know quite what's going on. They're receiving a bombardment of huge amounts of information and disinformation every day. They're getting many different sources of news 
values. And yet they don't have a sense of really who's speaking for them, who represents their interests anymore. Um, there's a huge confusion that is caused uh, by social media, as well as deliberate manipulation. There's no question that's a lot of disinformation, conspiracy theory, many false uh, stories that are circulating in the media, which undermine people's confidence in politics and in politicians as representing to them. These are all circumstances which allow populism to thrive. You've talked about there being a vacuum that uh, these forces are moving into. But is it also fashionable that, for instance, it would be a certain country would get into this kind of national mood? If it is a vacuum, is it drawing people into new areas as well? I mean, you've talked about, for instance, climate change as being one, one area that populism is moving into. Populism, because it's very flexible ideologically, it tends to attach itself to whatever issue comes along that provokes fear and a sense of outrage in people. So it's anger and fear that really drive it and which it seeks to to exacerbate and to, to hype up. So when there was fear about migration in 2015, 2016, the populists had a field day because that's a classic wedge issue uh, where they could raise both issues of injustice and also issues of fear. Um, they didn't really take much notice of climate until more recently when it's become a lot bigger. But now it's here and the youth climate activists and all politicians are beginning to understand what a kind of climate emergency we have. It's feeding on fear, but there's an interesting approach of different populists to climate. Some of them have moved into climate denial, taking on arguments that are are familiar from the US context, arguing it's not, in fact, the result of human activity. Some of them seem to be getting some funding from US sources, fossil fuel industry, and so on. Um, But then there are others who are moving more into eco-fascism, whereby they argue that we, the pure people of this country, we are defending the territory. We are les défendeurs du terroir. And this idea that we are going to keep uh, the rivers and the lakes and the forests clean. But when they say clean, they don't just mean of pollution, but also of foreigners. So this idea of the land being sacred to the pure people of this country means keeping other people off this land, keeping them out. So there they link their claims about environmental protection with their anti-immigration stance. And that has a very creepy historical resonance, doesn't it? It's very much what was promoted in the 1930s, certainly in Germany, this idea of, of nature conservation. The idea that somehow there's only one set of people in this country, there's only one race even, which really belongs to this territory. So this link between people and territory. And those kinds of tropes are coming back into politics in Europe in a really scary way. Is this driven by the people or is it driven by a strong person, strong man who is uh, seeking support? And where's the chicken? Where's the egg? There are always strong men seeking to gain power. Sometimes there are strong women who wish to gain power too. And populism is a very effective way of gaining much more um, visibility in the media. But there's a difference between the kinds of populists in Europe. There are some who are quite content to stay in the margins of politics and to be outrageous and to say things that break taboos. Think about Hert Wilders in the Netherlands, for example, who didn't ever really want to go into government, even when he had the opportunity to do so. But then you've got others who have gone into government. They start to do something very different. Uh, they, they move from being anti-establishment into trying to take over the institutions of the state. We've seen this, for example, in Hungary um, in the past 10 years. Uh, so that's a very different kind of populist. And then there are some who aren't quite sure what they want. Many of them, if they go into a coalition government, tend to seek only a few policy areas, primarily migration. That's the, They always want the migration ministry, the home affairs ministry. They don't bother themselves with finance on the whole. Um, they don't tend to go to foreign affairs. There are some exceptions, for example, Finland. Um, and they don't take on really difficult, complex problems of governance. Uh, they don't take on reform of the social security system or the tax system or the justice system even. It's just these niche issues which they like to go for. And the reason why they do that is because they're seeking to appeal to a particular part of the voter, both the voter base, but also the individual voter. They're seeking to appeal to the basest instincts of fear and anger. Um, and they don't really want to debate policy issues that take you to a different part of the brain. You know, fear and anger are in the reptilian limbic system of the brain. Whereas if you want to debate what should we do about climate change, what are the trade-offs between the difficult choices that are going to have to be made to decarbonize the economy, that's not about fear and about anger. That's about reason and uh, trade-offs and trying to work out how to reconcile many different interests and concerns. That's not something that populists ever want to engage in. So they are reaching out to voters with very simplistic messages And in an era of a great deal of fear in Europe, fear about climate, about terrorism, about the future of social security systems, it's very tempting to respond to fear and loathing messages.
messages by voting for somebody who gives you really simple messages and promises to protect you, even if in practice they can't deliver that protection. So do they know that's what they're doing? I mean, something that just occurred to me from this conversation by presenting populism as an ideology free phenomenon, as a policy free phenomenon to a certain extent, that it's really just about figuring out how to take advantage of people's fears and concerns. It's a very cynical approach. But generally speaking, I find that people believe what they say, particularly if they've said it enough times, that they do think that the policy positions they're taking, whether it's defense of the rivers from the unpure or defense of the oil companies from um, emission standards, they believe it. So what's your thought on this? Is this purely cynical desire for power for the sake of power? Is it an equally cynical desire for power for the sake of whatever financial gains it could give? Or are these people driven by ideologies that just happen to play on everybody's fears? There are different kinds of populists, and it's not ideology-free. It's a thin-centred ideology. It's a view of the world into which you can put many different ideological elements, and it's very adaptable to lots of different issues. It's this idea that there is out there a nasty, corrupt elite, which is um, out to enrich itself and to benefit um, at the expense of the ordinary people. Now, that's something you can put loads of different issues in there. And then you become that elite. If you go into government and you become that elite, you have to find somebody else to blame. So then you start blaming the European Union as the next level of government up. Or in the US, for example, you blame the UN and claim that they have black helicopters which are going to take over the country. I mean, you can you can come up with any number of conspiracy theories to find some other elite apart from yourself, which is somehow uh, doing down the people of the country. But what I think is really important to understand about populism is it gets a huge amount of media airtime because it doesn't really take responsibility for delivering results. So it's easy to say really outrageous and extreme things that get reported over and over again um, without anybody really looking at, okay, so what exactly have you delivered when you've gained power? Um, Have you actually delivered clean rivers? Uh, Have you actually delivered a better system, more justice for people, a better set of economic outcomes, more jobs? Populist parties in government don't have a very good record of doing this. They tend towards corruption. So what you typically see is what we saw in Austria, for example, where the far-right party, the Freedom Party, was in power and collapsed amidst yet another funding scandal whereby the leader of the party was caught on video offering essentially taxpayer-funded government contracts um, in return for support for his party. That's something very typical that happens is lining pockets and using access to state resources for private and personal enrichment. They also tend to go through big periods of infighting within the party. And you see a kind of a cycle of that with the Freedom Party. Um, They get into government, they start infighting, corruption scandal, and then they go out of government. And then people get fed up with the other parties and they start to build themselves up again. So it happens again and again. But what's much more important than just looking at the durations of populism, you know, people need to study that. It's important to understand what's going on um, and seeing where it doesn't deliver. But it's much more important to think about out, how do we have a 21st century system of governance which actually delivers justice and security for people and social security as well as physical security for people? Because if governments can do that again, if other parties can do that more effectively, then that simply reduces the appeal of populism. Populism is something that thrives in a vacuum when people are fearing a lot, they're feeling angry about a lot, and other parties are not addressing those things. And that's what really needs to happen now. We need to be able to have political debates uh, in which multiple voices are heard, in which we find new systems of governance for the digital age and for decarbonising economies. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. We are talking to Heather Graby of the Open Society European Policy Institute, and we're talking about populism in Europe. Before we get to solutions, and I really do want to get to solutions, I want to talk a little bit more about the problem. For right-wing populists, and certainly right-wing movements more generally, which tend, I think, in Europe at least, to have been populist, and some left-wing movements, there's been a lot of talk of ties to Russia, Russian support. There certainly is a tendency among right-wing movements and their leaders in the U.S. and in Europe 
to look to Russia as some sort of model for a conservative unit ethnic state, which is a terrible misreading of Russia. Do you see this as a Russian problem or a European problem? There's a lot going on in Russia itself. In Europe, the question that there is influence from disinformation and there's credible evidence that disinformation uh, comes from Russian sources. The way that, for example, you see in the German and the Italian election campaigns, there was a, a great deal of disinformation which was intending to undermine people's trust in democracy, trust in the voting system, trust, trust in political parties, trust in the, the very fundamentals of democracy. Um, and that's very worrying because that's extremely damaging for Europe, which really relies on a political system whereby voters participate, where there's citizen engagement in politics. Uh, it's precisely because democracy needs citizens to be fully engaged and to debate policy issues and to have their say and to find collective solutions that having an undermining of trust in the democratic system is so dangerous. Now, Europe is not the only place where this is happening. This is a global phenomenon in democracies. Uh, what I find worrying is the way that a lot of political parties, mainstream political parties, are still really quite complacent about it. Mm -hmm. They still seem to think that it's enough to run a new advertising campaign, to have a better website, to do a little bit more on Twitter. And actually, they need to be engaging at a much deeper level with people. They need to be making politics real at local and municipal level. They need to be engaging people very deeply in the policy issues. And the danger of populism at this moment, when we've got massive repercussions of digital transformation and of climate change going on in societies, that you actually need more citizen engagement, not less. So messages that citizen engagement doesn't matter to the citizens is very worrying for this period ahead. Heather, can you tell us a bit about the allegations about Russian interference? One of the places, the weak spots that uh, populists can exploit is obviously the idea of adding fuel to both sides of an argument. And that's one of the accusations against Russia. And one of them is hate speech. Is there any evidence that Russia is actually doing this? Does anybody study the results of it? Are they actually having an impact? And finally, does hate speech really lead to what International Crisis Group, for instance, is worried about, which is deadly conflict? Can you make a correlation between those two things? There's definitely evidence uh, from a host of civil society uh, groups who are monitoring this, and, and it's also there in reports of international agencies, fundamental rights agency, and so on, that hate speech does lead to hate crimes, and it leads to growing intolerance in societies. Uh, it makes it harder to keep the peace in very diverse societies, and particularly uh, to to maintain respect between communities, which is absolutely vital to have an open society. So by allowing the mainstreaming and constant media reporting of people saying really outrageous things about ethnic groups, faith groups, women, and vulnerable communities as well, by allowing that to, to take over and removing a sense of responsibility from a lot of politicians, that they have to uh, maintain a sense of respect, of tolerance, of essentially allowing people to live together. This is very damaging for the fabric of society. There's no question there's evidence about that. Now, where this is coming from, there are many different sources, and it's actually quite hard to tell often. There is uh, research out there about deliberate attempts to manipulate people into believing more hate speech, believing conspiracies about ethnic groups, believing conspiracies about Muslims, for example. There's a big responsibility of everybody in public life to maintain uh, the principle of an open society, as, as Karl Popper wrote about it in, in the 1940s. An open society is one in which you need to have multiple voices and diverse opinions, but they've got to also respect the common good. They've got to be aiming for, in the end, collective solutions uh, in the same way as a scientific community aims for a collective solution. Because if the intention behind expressing your opinion is to encourage other people to hate somebody or to hate a group, you're not leading to something that's going to benefit the whole community. Talking about collective solutions, obviously in Europe, the biggest collective solution maker is supposed to be the European Union. To what extent is populism undermining Europe's inner decision making process? Is that having much impact on its ability to project peace and security abroad around its neighbourhood? Populism is anathema to European integration because the whole principle of the EU, the whole idea behind European integration is for the leaders of one country to get together with the other countries to find collective solutions and to negotiate with one another and to find compromises and seek consensus. And all of those things are anathema to the populist who argues that you can't trust the elite of your own country and you can't trust foreigners. So the idea of the elite of your own 
country going to Brussels to negotiate with the elites of foreign countries, by definition, whatever they come up with is going to be against the interests of the people as either populist define them. And compromise will almost certainly be betrayal and consensus is impossible unless it's just serving the interests of elites. So the worldview, the very Manichaean worldview of the populist uh, is never going to accept the idea of win-win solutions between countries finding an outcome which is for the common good of all Europeans. Now, that's enormously important because if populists decry the EU, claim that it's doing things that's not in the interests of the people, bash it constantly, then you end up with things like Brexit and the conspiracy theories that have grown in the UK about the EU with all kinds of myths and lies propagated now in common parlance. Populists don't like the EU's working methods. They not only oppose its values, so human rights and democracy and justice and all the other things in Article 2 of the EU's treaties, they also don't like the way it operates, the whole working method. And that means populism has a chilling effect on ministers who gather in Brussels to debate things in the council. It has a chilling effect on the commission, which becomes more cautious about putting forward policy ideas. And it makes everybody involved in politics nervous about what they're doing. They start to become very, very defensive. So you've painted a very unpleasant picture of the results of populism. This podcast is called War and Peace. Should we worry about war in this context or should we just worry about a really unhappy piece. We shouldn't exaggerate the impact of populism because it is possible for mainstream parties to regain support. Look at how a number of parties, for example, the Dutch Socialists, have you know regained a lot of territory that they had lost. You see the way that a newcomer like Emmanuel Macron can come in and give a new message and he can win the presidency of France. Most of Europe is still run by mainstream parties. So let's not exaggerate. It's very important to understand what's going on with populism and the effects it has. But um, it hasn't taken over. And in fact, the more that people talk about it taking over, the more airtime they give to populist arguments. And that's damaging in like itself us. for democracy. <laughs> yeah, this is why I think we should think about the issues at stake, the policy issues, but also the issues for how to, to reclaim ground for democracy. But for the EU, it's really important that it keeps going and it keeps working because we're entering an age where huge transnational and intergenerational uh, challenges are facing all Europeans from digital transformation and from climate change. This is exactly the moment when you need transnational modes of governance and a possibility for countries to come together and take collective action for the benefits of the future humans, our children and grandchildren, um, to live in a better society. So this is precisely the moment when mainstream parties and politicians need to get their act together and take courage and energy from the youth movements for climate, um, from the many um, digital activists who are trying to put forward a much more positive view of how a digital society could work and really come up with a vision for the future, which isn't based on, trust me, I'll simply do a good job for you. You just need to vote for me. They need to engage with people in a much more detailed way. For example, I think through deliberative mechanisms of democracy, through citizens' assemblies and new methods, not just simply representation as we've known it since the 19th century. And also for them to talk about the issues people are scared about and people are angry about. It's not good enough to say, well, you know, that's globalisation. This is what happens. You have to address injustices and inequalities in both power and in economic terms um, in a serious way. So I think engagement is the answer. Are we seeing effective responses in this digital age anywhere? Any of these things that you're suggesting that focus on local engagement? Where, where is this being done? The citizens' assemblies that we're seeing in many parts of Europe, for example, Ireland, on issues to do with climate change, as well as, of course, the constitutional reform, this is really encouraging. And the results are very interesting because they show that when citizens are brought together and they're presented with real information and given a chance to discuss it and engage with it and really understand it and debate it, they come up with really good solutions, better ones than political parties often. They come up with solutions that no political party would dare to put forward on climate, for example. They're perfectly prepared to think about trade-offs and to understand that other in interests need to be reconciled, that not only their interest has to be represented in the solution. Um, so engaging people and having more trust in voters on policy issues is, I think, the way forward, because that also inoculates people against populism because they've thought about the issues and come up with their own solutions. They haven't just been presented with fait accompli by 
by elites. Another important way forward is to actually engage people where they are, which is online, on <laughs> social media. And populist parties have been much faster to get into social media. They've used it much more effectively. Mainstream parties are still, to a large extent, very complacent about it. But you need to take the debate to where people are, where they are in local communities, municipal level, but also where they are online and not assume that they're going to come to a party's website. And they need to think much more about how to make politics more appealing for people online. Um, I mean, when it takes as long to download a party manifesto online as to buy a plane on eBay, um, then why would you bother to go into that? Uh, why would you bother to take serious news stories if the Russia Today uh, kind of regurgitation by, by local news outlets um, is much easier to read? It means we need to look very carefully at responsibility of public broadcasters and build up public broadcasting, which has got a public service ethos and uh, and has proper funding because the business model of media is a huge issue here as well. But all of these elements are needed in the digital age when there's not what Karl Popper talked about in 1946, a problem with somebody claiming to have a monopoly on the truth. There are too many truths. There's too much information out there. You need to be able to make sense of it. And so things like digital literacy, but also um, giving citizens a chance to engage seriously in policy debates. That's the way forward. Heather Raby, I think that is a optimistic and therefore excellent note and this conversation on. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Also, big thanks to Antoine Leroux and Bula Media, our producers, and Miranda Sonnex, who makes it all work on the crisis group end. Thank you for tuning in to War and Peace. We'll be back with another podcast in two weeks' time. Meanwhile, check out all our work on www.crisisgroup.org. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.